Hello, this week we take a break from our textbook for a set of notes on classifying all this diversity of life, which we will talk about classification and taxonomics. We might ask, how do we keep track of all this life on Earth, and even why should we? Well, you know, as humans we do like to make sense of our environment, we like to organize life around us. It helps us understand our evolutionary relationships. We especially like to understand other organisms to understand our own selves. For ecology and conservation, can we uh, help protect other organisms, protect them from extinction, etc.? And you never know when we might find some important discovery such as an organism that creates a substance that can be medically useful to us such as a number of years ago a sponge was discovered that makes a toxin that kills cancer cells according to the website here that you can visit at discovery.com this is what we have to deal with when, uh, de when classifying organisms. Um, according to their calculations, about 15,000 new species are discovered each year, although that number is dropping with human encroachment on habitats. 7.77 million more species of animals should exist on Earth. 298,000 more species of plants, over 600,000 more species of fungi, 6,400 more species of protists or protozoa, and researchers, according to that article, used data on past discoveries, including the taxonomic classifications, to make those predictions. I uh, checked the internet to look up some newly discovered species and I came across a few that were kind of neat so I cut and pasted some pictures for you to look at this is a, uh, a babbler bird discovered in India in September of 2006 kind of pretty and of course when a new species is discovered then scientists and discoverers have to go through a process to classify it. I just like this one for its name, the Smoky Honey Eater. Discovered not too long ago, New Guinea. Looks like um, Indonesia is a hot spot to find new species like this golden mantled tree kangaroo in 2005 and this small frog I guess it was so small that you really couldn't see it you had to listen for it or this shrew shrew like creature I should say first seen in 2005 and then captured in 2006 Here's a chart that I found from the U.S. News and World History on the numbers of organisms. Looks like um, mosquitoes really are going to take over the world here with insects having so many different species. Minnesotans can relate to that. With plants next, uh, non-insect arthropods, not good news, I guess, if you don't like spiders. And on down the line with mammals at the bottom here at just over 4,000 species. Here's a list of hot spots if you're going to discover new species. Looks like the United States might not be a place to do that, but in jungles and such like Laos, Vietnam, Philippines, Madagascar, the rainforests of South America 
where so much vegetation exists that it's hard to get in there as a human and so there really are new species waiting in there just to be discovered. Next a little history of classification. Before our modern classification schemes European and American biology consisted primarily of a science called taxonomy which is the classification of organisms into different categories based on their physical characteristics and presumed natural relationship. Today we're able to use more precise techniques such as DNA analysis instead of just the physical characteristics. One of our first classifiers going back quite a few years here to Aristotle, a Greek philosopher who studied under Plato. He had some interesting thoughts back at that time. It was believed that all species were fixed and that God had created them and they were unchanging. And so Aristotle came up with his scale of nature. Through observations of nature, he recognized certain affinities among organisms, and he concluded that life forms could be arranged on a ladder or a scale of increasing complexity, and he called that the scale of nature. Each form of life would then be perfect and permanent and then had an allotted rung in the ladder of life. Those ideas then would be generally consistent with the Old Testament account of creation, which holds that species were individually designed by God and therefore perfect. Interestingly enough, he divided organisms into two groups plants and animals and then he further divided animals into groups of those with blood and those without blood. Then he also divided animals into three groups according to how they moved, walking, flying, or swimming, basically land, air, or water. And interestingly enough his system was used well into the 1600s. Later on some other scientists would come about with some more modern thinking. First a little discussion question. Did Aristotle's three group system have any built in problems? Um, obviously you could see that with our great diversity of life that we know today that yes there would be some problems. For instance some animals would fit into more than one group like a duck or an alligator who can walk and swim. His system looked more at behaviors rather than similarities and differences in forms, such as bats and birds both fly, but they're very different in form. In the 1700s, Carolus Linnaeus came about. He was a Swedish botanist, and then he became a physician, and then um, reverted back to being a botanist, published 180 books, including the important one we know today as the uh, the Systema Nature. I don't know if I said that right. He's known for uh, coming up with naming organisms with a genus and a species. He even um, was known with his um, first name as Carl von Linn, but then later known as Carolus Linnaeus because it sounds like a genus and a species. In his system he classified plants and animals according to similarities in form. He divided living things into one of two kingdoms, again plant and animal. Then he divided each of the kingdoms into smaller groups called genera, which is plural for genus. And then divided each genera into smaller groups called species. He designed a system of naming organisms called binomial nomenclature, which is a two naming system, giving them a genus and a species. And if you were to write that correctly, you should always capitalize genus and lowercase the species 
and if you can do it in italics or underline it if you can't do italics. Uh, this was a very useful system because now with their Latin genus and species there could be less confusion around the world when scientists and people talk with one another about organisms. All organisms have a common name or actually more than one common name depending on where you're from and so this system helps to decrease confusion worldwide. It's like a language of science. We still use the binomial nomenclature today however today we use or most scientists use a six kingdom system not just the two. For instance, if you're wondering about the confusion, uh, do you call this animal a cougar, a mountain lion, a panther, or a puma? Well, it actually has those different names depending on where you're from. Some people call this a spotted skunk, but I'll even say my father called it a civet cat. It actually is a spotted skunk. This is what a civet cat looks like. And they look like this as well. Here's another one. And another one. And so yes, with all the different organisms, it's good to have a, a two-name system, a genus and a species, to reduce that confusion so that we can tell the difference between organisms and so that they have a name. It would be like having your first and last name to tell you apart from other individuals as opposed to just a first name. Though Linnaeus believed in the fixity of species, that all species were unchanging, he's actually helping kind of pave the way for Darwin with his system though Linnaeus looked more at the physical characteristics. Um, Darwin argued in the 1800s that classification should be based on evolu evolutionary relationships. But he also noted that the work that Linnaean did, Linnaeus did um, actually reflected the evolutionary relationships by the way he, he classified them. You remember down here we have a phylogenetic tree. We studied those previously. Our common ancestor here and adaptive radiation causing speciation and sometimes extinction occurs. Or here's our past and here's our present day organisms. You might ask, well, how many species are there? I looked up an article from Scientific American Magazine, a well-renowned magazine. And to date, they said that scientists have cataloged approximately 1.5 million species. There's many estimates of how many species total there should be, all the way up to 100 million. Um, some scientists, like Stephen Jay Gould, estimate that 99% of all species that were ever alive on Earth are now extinct some that we'll never know, never see, or perhaps we'll find their fossils to know that they did exist. Current classification systems have developed from Linnaeus's original works. Modern classification systems, though, are much more complicated and have many levels of hierarchical organization and are taxonomic, meaning they look at structural and physiological connections between organisms and they're phylogenetic. They're based on genetic connections between organisms and are structurally based on Darwin's theory of evolution. Yes, one of the problems with um, students is reading scientific names because they're not uh, obviously words that we commonly use that's because most of them come from Latin and sometimes Greek. Latin was chosen as a language to write scientific names 
due to it being referred to as a dead language, there's a little change that occurs with it, such as uh, no slang is added, like with the English language. Robert Whitaker, in 1969, then, was the first pr to propose the Five Kingdom Taxonomic Classification System instead of Aristotle and Linnaeus's Two Kingdoms. In 1969, he proposed that all living things could either be an animal, a plant, a fungus, a protist, or Monera, which is bacteria. Today, though, scientists, or at least most scientists, agree that there is at least six kingdoms of life. Some think there's more. But those six kingdoms are plants, animals, and funguses. Those are probably the three that most people are familiar with. Then there's the protista, which is a very diverse kingdom. And then bacteria was divided into two separate kingdoms, eubacteria or regular bacteria, and then archaebacteria, which are very uh, kind of weird bacteria. They're known as extremophiles because of the odd places that we find them. Archaebacteria are organisms like methanogens, halophiles, and thermophiles. They're prokaryotic, meaning they have no nucleus. Their metabolism depends on the species, but um, they may metabolize some odd things. They do need hydrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, sulfur, and some hydrogen sulfide gas It might be needed for metabolism. They're, to get nutrition, it depends on the species but many are by absorption, non-photosynthetic, phos photophosphorylation, and chemosynthesis. Their reproduction is asexual by binary fission. That simply means a cell splitting in two. Budding or fragmentation. Fragmentation is when a piece falls off and grows into a new organism. And budding is when a bud grows off of an organism and then becomes a clone of the original. These guys are known to exist under some of the most extreme conditions like extremely hot places, acidic places, and alkaline environments. And there's still a lot not known about them yet. Our next kingdom, bacteria, also called eubacteria, and previously called Monera in the older systems, include regular bacteria that you might be used to, like bacteria that cause, or causes strep throat or E. coli. Also, though, cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae. They're also prokaryotic with no nucleus in their cell. Their metabolism depends on the species. Oxygen, though, for those that are anaerobic, um, could be toxic, or if it's an aerobic bacteria, it can be tolerated. To get nutrition, could be by absorption, photosynthesis, or chemosynthesis, meaning they take in other chemicals than what you might be used to. They reproduce by binary fission. Fission means to split, and bi means to. So that simply is an asexual reproductive method in which a cell divides into two. Protista, sometimes called the catch-all kingdom, include amoeba, green algae, brown algae, diatoms, euglena, which is a type of algae, slime molds, and paramecium. They are eukaryotic, meaning they have a large cell that contains a nucleus. Bacteria tend to be smaller. Their metabolism, oxygen will be needed for food. Their nutrition intake depends, whether it be absorption, ingestion, such as engulfing by phagocytosis or by ph 
photosynthesis in the algae. They're mostly asexual, meaning their cell would have to split in two. But there is some other interesting me mechanisms that some protists uh, do in order to switch up their DNA a bit, such as paramecium conjugation, in which DNA is swapped between paramecia. And then they go off and divide. Fungi, these are organisms like mushrooms and molds, mildew. Yeast are an example of a single-celled fungi, though most are multi-celled. They're eukaryotic, meaning their cell has a nucleus. They need oxygen, and to eat, they usually release enzymes onto their food and then absorb the nutrients, which then makes the food look disgusting because it's being literally digested in front of our eyes. Reproduction is asexual and sexual. Plants or plantae. These are organisms that are quite familiar to us, like moss, flowering plants, ferns and trees. They're eukaryotic. They need oxygen as well as carbon dioxide, which is used in photosynthesis. They are known as the producers of the world, or autotrophs, because they can make their own sugar through photosynthesis. Some species produce, reproduce asexually by mitosis, and others can reproduce sexually. Animals, or animalia, which is the kingdom that humans belong to, are mammals and amphibians, reptiles, sponges, Insects, worms, mollusks, fish, and sharks. They are eukaryotic, meaning their cells have a nucleus. And we do require oxygen. We have to ingest our food, meaning we are heterotrophs. Our reproduction is sexual, though some of the simple animals, like sponges and uh, jellyfish, can asexually reproduce by budding or fragmentation. What about viruses? Well, they're actually not included in any of the present kingdoms because they don't quite have all the characteristics needed to actually say that they are alive. For instance, they don't have cells. And in order to reproduce, they must be inside another organism and hijack the organism's reproductive machinery so they don't reproduce on their own either. Here's a chart. What would be missing here? Well, looks like we're missing our sixth kingdom. And domains. Today they've added three domains which is above the kingdom level. Those three domains are the bacteria domain, the archaea domain, and the eukaryota domain. Bacteria, also known as prokaryotes because their cells don't have a nucleus, fall under the bacteria kingdom, also called eubacteria. Archaea include the archaebacteria. And the rest of the kingdoms, these four, protists, animals, fungi, and plants, all fall under the domain eukarya. So once again, bacteria under the bacteria domain, archaea under the archaea domain. These are also known as archaebacteria. And the last four kingdoms here, protus, animals, fungi, and plants under the eukarya domain. And again, domains are above the level of kingdom. And classification then, with our eight levels, looks like this. Domain being the first and the most broad. Kingdom 
phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, with the last two jet designations being your scientific name. Here is a example of an organism that has been classified, which leads us all the way down to their genus and species being Canis lupus, or the gray wolf. The one thing that's missing here, though, is the domain, and the domain would be Eukarya, if you guessed it. Taxonomy is an attempt to bring order and unity to the great diversity of life. Because of our evolutionary relationships, we share the unity of our characteristics of life, such as the way we get our food and our genetic code, but yet through, a, through adaptive evolution, we have our great diversity. Here's the Linnaean classification of humans. Our domain would be Eukarya. Our kingdom is Animalia, which means that we are multicellular organisms with cells that have a nucleus. We're eukaryotes. We have cell membranes, but we don't have cell walls. There are no single-celled animals. Phylum chordata means we have a spinal cord that's dorsal, meaning on our backs. We're in the class of mammals, meaning we are warm-blooded. We bear live young. Females have mammary glands that secrete milk. Our order is primates. We share that order with other primates, including chimps and gorillas, and gibbons, and orangutans. It means that we're mammals with a collar bone, and our eyes face forward. We have grasping hands with fingers and two types of teeth, including incisors and molars. Our family is the hominid or hominidae family, meaning we're primates with an upright posture, a large brain, stereoscopic vision, a flat face, and different use of our hands and feet. With uh, humans, the use of our hands refers to our opposable thumbs. Our genus is Homo. These are hominids with an S-curved spine and recognizable as a human. And sapiens, we have a high forehead, well-developed chin, and thin skull bones. And uh, Homo sapiens basically means smart human. Here's another example of an organism that has been classified. This one actually starts in the domain of Eukarya, kingdom animal, phylum chordata, class mammal. So we would actually share these first four classifications, classification levels with this animal. But they are of a different order than us. They're order carnivora. Family Philidae, genus Panthera, and species Pardus. Some might ask about organisms like this. Well, wh where do they fit into the classification scheme? Well, unfortunately, um, it sounds kind of bad, but they're kind of like a dead end organism. They're a hybrid, which is a result of two different species mating. And because they're different species and probably have different chromosome or chromosome numbers, um, that creates problems with breeding. So they're usually a dead end and are sterile and sometimes unable to survive very long. So this says this is a liger, which is the breeding of a male lion to a female tiger. The opposite, if you had a male tiger and a female lion, then it would be a tigon, although those are more rare because the tiger is less apt to accept the female. 
and they are usually sterile. The zebroid, the result of a horse and a zebra. Again, another hybrid. One method of classifying and identifying objects includes using a taxonomic key, sometimes also called a dichotomous key. A taxonomic key looks at the similarities and differences between objects using a series of paired statements that are usually numbered, such as 1 A and B and then 2 A and B and so on. The paired statements describe contrasting characteristics. It's best to use observable physical characteristics for this. And you choose one statement out of the pair that happens to be true of the object or organism you're trying to identify. The statement you choose may ask you to go on to another pair of statements, or it may give you the name of the object. Thank you to Glenn Westbrook of the Utah State Office of Education for these next two examples. This one is for some common forms of money that they've made up in order to identify money, such as a penny, nickel, dime, quarter, or dollar bill, etc. You'll choose one denomination of money and try to follow the key to identify what you have. Even if you already know the name of the denomination you're looking at, uh, it helps you practice the taxonomic or dichotomous key. So let's say we pick the dollar bill. So we would go to question one, and we would read them both. Is it metal or is it paper? If it's paper, like it is, we'll go to number five. If it would have been metal, we would have went to number two. Going to number five, is there an A, and a number one in the corner, or B, a number two in the corner? Well, looking closely at the $1 bill, there is a one in the corner, so it is indeed a $1 bill. Here's a taxonomic or dichotomous key to, to five kingdoms. This one leaves out the kingdom Archaebacteria, such as, uh, let's say that we were trying to identify an animal. We would ask first, Questions number 1A and B, is it one cell or more than one? Since animals are more than one cell, we'll go to number three. Is it autotrophic or heterotrophic? Well, humans can't make their own food, so they're not autotrophic. They have to find their food, so we're heterotrophic. Hetero means other and trophic means feeder. So we'll go to number four. Are we A, mobile, or B, immobile? Since animals are mobile, then we'll pick 4A, and we are indeed animalia. We'll practice doing more of these in our lab. And this concludes the notes section for this week. And um, your test for this will be taken directly from these PowerPoint notes. And any of the videos that I have pasted in for you to watch in D2L. So make sure you do watch those videos. And we'll see everybody at lab.